into first place for number one. Harris drops back, fades to the left, pressure on, and he goes down. Ja'Garrett Davis gets home, and the all-black sideline explodes here in Hamilton. Torn to five, it went through Marcus Dale's hands, and Kyron Moore, the presence of mind to catch it and step out of bounds at the five with 20 seconds to go. Pressure loads it up, goes down the field, taking a shot into the end zone. He caught it. Touchdown, Tiger Town. Brandon Banks, how did he do it? Okay, now that's really outdated. Uh, I thought that it, I thought that it was outdated. With, I was like, yeah, you know what? We'll have to get some new Bombers calls in there for the new voice of your Winnipeg Blue Bombers, Derek Taylor. Uh, but I, I didn't realize that I had Jagarad Davis and Brandon Banks on the Tie Cats. Uh, some some current Argos all of a sudden. DT. Yep, man. I was just. Uh, I was finally. It takes me forever to get to the Great Cup to chart the Great Cup after the season. Jagarad Davis. Wrecked. I forgot how badly he wrecked people in that game. Like he was getting Jamarcus Hardrick, who was fantastic at yeah. right tackle. He got he got him in a variety of ways in that game. Shakira Davis has been one of my favorites for a long time, and it's a that was a great pickup by Toronto. Now I didn't chart it, but when I went back and watched the Grey Cup, the thing that I was interested in was Drew Desjardins because I was trying to get an assessment of him before he went off and signed his NFL futures deal with the Patriots and. He mm-hmm. was he was matched up against Dylan Wynn on about 90% of the snaps throughout the game. And Monster. there was really nothing spectacular by either of them in that game. But it was kind of like King Kong versus Godzilla, where <laughs> it was just a rock fight for four quarters, where it was like so physical, the two of them against each other. And it never really turned into anything. So it's nothing really popped on tape of like, wow, what a great pass rusher. Oh my God, Deja like killed him there. It was just every single snap was like, fire off the ball, grab each other, clutching, pulling. Like it, it was exhausting watching those two guys go at it. So it's funny to, to hear you say that about the Grey Cup specifically, because I remember when I went back and watched them, like, I don't know why I care about this because there's nothing happening, but it's just amazing to watch two guys that are that good at what they do battle for four quarters. I, I, I was, we watched free agency. I thought Dylan Wynn was the guy who might get away from Hamilton because Grey Cup two years in a row, you're going to lose some guys, some talented mm-hmm. players. I was I was afraid for them a little bit that Dylan Wynn was going to get away because Ted Laurent wasn't in 21 what he was in past seasons. I uh, from from a Tie Cats fan perspective, they they have to be delighted that that guy's back because he is. I don't know if he's 28, 2017, 2018 Micah Johnson level, but it, it ain't far off, honestly, the way he's been going. Yeah, and Ottawa was super in on him too. Like Berkey said yep. that in the behind the R episode, right? Where he's I love that they put out the snippet where Berkey's sitting in the in the empty locker room and the camera's on before they turn it on. He's like, Well, like we want to give him the real shit, right? Like we want to like let's be let's be honest. Like he's like Dil- I wanted Dylan Wynn. Like it's very well known that I was very forward, that I was out there trying to get Dylan Wynn. And he said, No, it was like got pretty much everybody else I would guess that he kind of wanted on that list whether it be the levels and money hunter combo or if it be mm-hmm. anyways th- this is the point of this episode as we welcome you back in and we thank you for being around and, and subscribing and listening to Canadian Football Perspective today DT and I are going to be diving in on uh, each of us have five storylines and we haven't talked about these so if we step on each other's toes on it we'll just make up other ones on the fly because I got a list of about 10 here uh, that are <laughs> just interesting things that we've we've kind of noticed or that we've thought about throughout the off season that we're looking forward to going into this year because I keep seeing all of you great CFL fans out there posting things saying you know 100 days to the preseason and uh, and less than 100 days to regular season and all that stuff so it is coming despite the fact that uh, winter is holding its grips on the weather throughout much of the country in various places uh, we're looking forward to getting back out on the field and to calling games and and the first thing I want to do DC because uh, I didn't address it formally off the top is happy for you uh, this is this is really cool hey, to buddy. be able to go to Winnipeg and call Bombers games and be on CJOB, and it's a cool gig. And I know I've read, I, I implore people to go read the interview that you did with Ed Tate because I thought it was fantastic. I know you've done the video with Ed Tate. One of the first things I thought when you were on that Zoom interview with Ed was, man, we get the weekly Ed Tate, Derek Taylor sit-down conversation teeing up games now. And I'm like, that I love that. That's going to be such good stuff. And, and selfishly for yeah. me, calling games where I might not be calling Winnipeg games all the time. I might be doing a bunch in the East this year. It's really cool to be able to to keep tabs on these different teams in different markets and know so that if you guys come into the East and I'm calling a game Winnipeg at Hamilton or something, I'm filled in because you guys are going to create great stuff. I know that fans will be able to enjoy. 
Yeah, I, I'm super excited. Absolutely check out the interview on uh, bluebombers.com that Ed Tate did. Uh, I've, I've enjoyed, most people have been very, you know, complimentary, saying nice things about me. The ones I've enjoyed the most, though, are the people, I, obviously, Riders and Bombers have played in back-to-back -back West Finals and the Riders that lost two in a row. So I was calling the team that lost the two in a row in the West Final. People are like, ah, I hope you call a third straight loss in the Western Final. <laughs> I, I get that. Congratulations. Please do call a third loss in the Western final. Like if, so help me. If Kalaros hits the crossbar uh, on the final play in a game at Mosaic Stadium, <laughs> and I'm there to go, okay, well, that's three now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no great cup for the team that I, I work alongside. But, uh, no, I was super excited for the opportunity and super excited to be able to create more great uh, CFL content around the Bombers and around some of our, our sister stations as well. They have a CGOB is sister stations in Calgary and Edmonton that cover the football teams too. So nice. potentially some, uh, some work with the great broadcasters, Mark Steven and Morley Scott there. Awesome. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun to see what you come up with and, and being able to dive full-time into doing that. Cause for people that don't know, you're not doing a show like you were sports cage on CKRM. So it's no. all CFL all the time, content creation, branching out, talking about things and whatever platforms you choose. So uh, if anybody has followed DT here and on his social media, you know that he's going to be uh, pumping out some fun stuff. So make sure you're following. Oh. Uh, and what is, what is the social handle going to become? Is there any changes coming? Uh, I haven't decided yet, right? Because okay. when you change your name, for folks who don't know, if you have a blue check mark on Twitter, if you change your handle, like now it's DT on SC, if you change that, blue check mark goes away yeah. and you become, you know, you don't get into certain people's feeds in certain ways. So uh, DT on OB has a perfect rhyming ring to it and it just goes, it goes great. But I'll have to consult with the gang at CGOB to go, what do I do here? Because I can't think of a way to keep it as SC sports center. It was the, it was sports cage. Uh, I don't, I don't know what, what I could possibly do to keep DT on SC. I'm laughing so hard at this because people might think listening to them. That's all. That's really egotistical of you. Do you like that's, it doesn't actually matter. You can change, lose your blue check mark. Who cares? When I lost my job doing TSN radio, when they shut down the station immediately, like I was in a state of shock and rush to judgment. And this is like a good life lesson for people that when bad things happen to you, just like take the afternoon to like push back and be like, okay, I'm yep. going to assess all the angles of it and we'll figure this thing out and it'll be okay. And uh, the, the afternoon, I got let go at noon, 11.55, right before we started our free agency show in 2021, uh, that was not to be. And I, I essentially like on the way home thought, I don't work for TSN anymore. So I dropped the TSN and I became at CFL underscore Marsh. Cause I'm like, CFL is my thing. I cover the CFL. If I don't work for TSN, I'm not going to keep that in. Well, lo and behold, of course, TSN comes around and says, do you want to do this stuff? So I switched it back really quickly. Cause one of my friends said, man, somebody might scoop up TSN underscore Marsh and start tweeting as you. And people won't know the difference if they don't look closely enough. They're like, that's kind of dangerous. Like some CFL fan that doesn't like you might jump in and do that. I'm like, yeah, you know what? So by the end of the day, I had switched back to TSN underscore Marsh. I realized like three months later, I'm like, oh shit, I don't have the blue check mark anymore. Like it, yeah. it, I didn't even yeah. put two and two together in that moment. I was just like, well, I don't work for TSN. I changed it. Um, and it does matter because it does help some of your reach and it does legitimize you. And, you know, if I reach out to a random person like Chad Ochocinco, hey, I want to have you on the CFP podcast. If he sees the blue check mark, it matters a little bit more. And I reapplied for the verification. Twitter was like, no, dog, sorry. You're, you're not a big enough name anymore. So it was like, not only did I lose it by my own doing because I didn't put two and two together, I also can't get it back now because they yeah. don't, don't think that I'm either a big enough name or that I'm the person that I used to be when I was verified. Very confusing, but it's just a funny, <laughs> funny dynamic. Snap a photo of you with Matt Dunnigan in the booth and that'll get it back <laughs> right away. He's wearing a blue suit. You got a blue check mark. It'll be, uh, It'll be all good. Man. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, we'll let people know as well that CFP podcast, of course, is brought to you by our friends at Fox 40. You can master your game plan with Fox 40 coaching boards, choose from a range of clipboards and carry boards to help with your sideline needs. Visit Fox 40 shop.com to uh, shop coaching boards and more. And you can take 15% off your order using the promo code CFP 15 is the place to go and get all set up for your season. Whenever it's coming, summer ball, spring ball, headed into the fall, whatever you need, use that promo code on fox40shop.com, CFP15. All right, let's dive into our uh, our top five thoughts here in the last little while, things that we are looking forward to. The floor is yours, voice of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. 
I since you're on the east, I am going to start in the west, and this has an ellipsis at the end. If Nathan Rourke is even average, dot dot dot, mm. BC could be or like this is a thing that we see in the NFL all the time. An amazing rookie quarter. Oh, hey, Joe Burrow takes the Cincinnati Bengals to the Super Bowl game because he's on a rookie contract. He's low paid compared to the fifty million dollars a year quarterbacks make now we we don't see it in the cfl though right we really just don't but nathan rourke making 70 grand this year bc can go out in free agency and bring in luchez purifoy and steven richardson and bring in uh well keep brian burnham and get, give lucky whitehead 200 grand and dominic rhymes is back and where are they going to be on canadian receivers in the draft because that Whichever fill pot they take in the draft will be a very low price. BC has a one-year opportunity, and I'm so happy to see them absolutely busting it, handing out money left and right. Uh, Delvin Bro, oh, by the way, in what is this the best defensive backfield that we've seen in, in five years? Uh, th that BC gets this opportunity to go out and get a ton of talent and surround their quarterback with it. So if Nathan Rourke is even average, BC contends for first place in the West. He just has to be, he doesn't have to be special. He doesn't have to be uh, 20, 2018 Bowley by Mitchell. He just has to be average. And it could be, it could be a huge jump for the BC Lions. Yeah, I, I, I'm so excited for BC's season to the point where full transparency, I reached out to Amar Doman, their owner, and said, I want to call as many of your games as possible. Because even though it's on the other <laughs> yeah. side of the damn country, I'm like, I want to call as many Nathan Rourke games as I can so I can talk to him as much as possible, so I can study them as closely as possible, because I want to be close to this thing that we have not seen in the CFL in a long time, like in a meaningful way to have a Canadian. And again, like I talked to Neil McAvoy from the Lions at the Ontario Regional Combine. I went up and introduced myself. We'd never really talked that much. And I told him I love what they were doing. I love the strategy. I love some of the moves in free agency. And he said straight out to me, it didn't matter whether he was Canadian American or not. Like there, when we were evaluating him before the draft in 20, I guess it would have been 2020, 2019. I forget what it was, but um, the idea of being able to look at his skill set, he said, we would be signing this kid. So why would we mm -hmm. judge it any differently? And there is one thing that, that scares me a little bit about Rourke that I picked up on when I was doing the heat charts this off season. And it's, if you look at quarterbacks who have struggled in the CFL game at a young age, there's one tendency that's jumped out to me. It's throwing the ball a, a higher than average percentage of attempts from zero to 10 yards outside the right numbers to the right uh, sideline. And the th the reason that that concerned me is that I saw that that was above average for Rourke, which kind of, I was like, ooh, light bulb, why is that? And I started looking into it, and I went back, and players that have had that tendency, uh, Dominic Davis in Ottawa in 2019 was a super high percentage guy. Brandon Bridge was a super high percentage guy out that way um, in that exact same zone. And for right-handed quarterbacks, that tends to be, I, I don't have a full field vision yet. I don't have a, a great understanding of where I want to go with this thing, and I can't read the full field. So I'm reading short side a lot, and I'm getting the ball out as quickly as I can, zero to 10, quick outs, quick slants, flat rep, whatever it might be. And that's not damning on Rourke's game at all. I'm a huge fan of his game. Anybody who follows me on Twitter knows every time he makes a good throw, I post it like without, <laughs> without context because I'm just like, look, it's fun. Uh, but yeah, that was one that I, I hope that when I start to look at where he's dispersing the football this year, that it's a little bit wider and he's starting to see the field in a different way. And honestly, I asked G. Roy Simon about that recently as well at a regional combine, got into this conversation with him. And G. Roy said he was getting the ball out so quick just because he was figuring it out. Like he was getting up to speed and figuring it out. And he said, it's going to slow down for him. And he's going to find a way to, to put the ball into different places and into more adventurous places. Cause down the field, he really didn't challenge um, very much. And, but again, to your point, how much do they need him to challenge downfield? How much risk do you want him taking if he is getting up to speed on these things? Uh, it's going to be such a fun study for guys like you and I throughout this year because yeah. he's got the skills and it's just a matter of how Jordan McSimmick, their offensive coordinator, pieces it together and surrounds him in a way that makes him, every time he steps into the huddle, it's going to be important this year that Rourke feels like this is home. 
like I've got protection, I've got the right scheme, I've got players that I, I get their body language, how they're getting in and there, their breaks. Um, so yeah, I'm with you. That's going to be a really fun one. Yeah, I'm I'm not convinced he has the protection that he needs. Like Joel Figueroa back at left tackle, fantastic. They're going to take a shot with a new guy at right tackle. Sook Chung is back to me better in the run game than in the pass game. Uh, I believe God they're back at center. I don't know what they're going to do at left guard, but that's reminiscent of the lineup that people had a ton of criticism of last season. So hmm. uh, work. Uh, we'll we'll see what that what that is once once the season kicks off. The thing about uh, to the right, zero to 10 yards downfield, uh, I'm always, I do mind boundary and field side as opposed to left, right. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I mean, there's, there's, I, I feel like that's the more important thing for me in the Canadian football league is you see how much it's, it's lessened over time, but in 15 and 16, when I started, it was very heavily boundary two, boundary one. Those were your guys that, uh, that mm-hmm. you hit up. It's now become a, you know, uh, a Greg Ellingson from the from the second position field league. So I'm curious how much of that is he uh, he loves his. It must have been Burnham. Uh, it must have been a lot of Burnham and flips. But uh, he loves his. 28 percent of his passes went to his two strong receiver. So uh, interesting that uh, he was. That was by far the one he targeted the most. Whether that's corner routes or or deep ins or it was just hey that's Brian Burnham and that's where I'm going with the football and this this alignment he was very heavily uh to the field side in that respect so i'm curious to see but yeah it he just he doesn't have to be even great right he doesn't he just doesn't have to because there's so much other talent and then oh by the way the floor with his run game is as high as i don't know his floor is as high as a cody fajardo level he doesn't have fajardo's experience that may be overstating it but uh work brings a lot that i want to see and a lot of smart football people are are high on him and i don't think it's strictly because he's canadian and a runner two things we love in quarterbacks so if he's even average marsh oh oh boy i was i i pulled up my depth chart for B, the bc lines can i interest you in this back six yes i have to put on my reading glasses because i'm an old man uh <laughs> delvin bro and tj lee to the boundary yep um you, you could have i don't know what they'll do with safety it could be marcus sales uh Keontae harden had some really nice really nice uh, points uh, early in the season, Gary Peters is now your field cornerback. Oh, and Luchez Purifoy at the Sam linebacker spot. That back six is bonkers, bonkers. And that's not even the guys who are going to kill the quarterback. Boom, watch them, and then they can go Canadian at that other one. And then two Canadian linebackers sweeping up the mess in the middle. BC defense might lead the whole thing. So just, just shoot for average. Yeah. Be Matt Nichols level plus a plus some run element, and BC is going to be great. Yeah, Stove and, and Woody Barron on the inside and free agency to go along with Boom and those guys. And yeah, I'm, I'm with you. They've yeah. got a lot of pieces. And, and I, I hope that Rourke is not uh, viewed as a crutch at any point. I hope that he is he's celebrating. He gives them a reason to get excited. But that's uh, DT's first. Mine is uh, is a fairly simple one. Ottawa's rebuild. Like I, anytime, yeah. anytime that you can turn things around quickly in the Canadian Football League, which you can in free agency based on the way things are designed with the short contract lengths, number of players, the free agency, um, the draft. I mean, the, the reason that I'm excited about this for Ottawa is it's a great football market. I love being around Ottawa, seeing Ottawa football fans' passion. They're one of the most vocal groups on social media as well. And I, I think that they deserve a team that is worth celebrating, not necessarily winning every single game, but one that's interesting. And let's be real, the last two years, they weren't even interesting. Like they, they were bad and there wasn't a lot to talk about. It was like the quarterbacks can't complete passes. We've got five different guys taking snaps under center. We don't even know who our running back is. Uh, protection scheme is sketchy. It was just, there were so many things where it just didn't feel like Ottawa had the team that they probably deserved. And now that now they're going to get closer to that. And I don't know how fast this is going to be turned around what their their ceiling is necessarily but i do know that they're going to be significantly better and uh, it all starts with jeremiah and mm-hmm. the reason that i thought ottawa was a good fit in free agency for jeremiah is just lapo and it's not even that he's going to scrap his whole scheme and build something around it. he's going to ask jeremiah to do things he's done in the past but i do believe that lapo has a creative mind and he he has this tendency to trust people that he's interested in Um, whether that's Matt Nichols and that's fair and that was right to do or not I think we saw in 2021 that that wasn't necessarily the best marriage in Ottawa but with Masoli coming in he can talk to him in a real way that he couldn't with Caleb Evans 
And I like Caleb Evans. I've said that before. I said that a lot. But to talk to Caleb Evans and be raw and real with him, you're again, you're trying to download knowledge of the CFL to him as you're trying to expect him to do things. Soli's been around, man. Like he's seen all this stuff. So whether it's going back watching old game film or Lapo referencing something that Masoli did in his past, or the conversations they can have will be at a higher level. And that jumps your potential immediately. Like without even mm-hmm. adding an Acklin or a Willie P at running back or the offensive line overhaul they do with Comber Williams. And like, I, I really think that Sean Burke did an excellent job at securing the landmark piece. That's going to give them instant hope. Because Lapo talks about that, the quarterback has to be able to give your organization hope. And obviously, nobody was really doing that outside of Caleb in, in 2021. And now we get to see how far they can push the Montreals and the Torontos and sneak a win here and a win there. And all of a sudden, like, because let's think about this, DT. In 2021, the Ottawa Red Blacks were not out of the playoff race until I believe week 14 out of like 16 even though they were what they were it's the east division and you're always around until the end there's always a chance that you can sneak in the back door and i think ottawa's got enough talent to more than sneak in and be a playoff team and give themselves a shot depending on matchups and health when they get there oh i for me ottawa this was my number two one that ottawa for me ottawa is is easily a playoff team in the east just looking at it and this is all this is all you know we're guessing based on the talent that we see and the coaches that we know are there. Ottawa's absolutely a playoff team. And it's a great deal of that is Masoli. I was just pulling up uh, uh, their offense last season, 11 touchdown passes, 17 interceptions, 59% completion rate. Um, 59%. I'm trying to think of the era of the CFL in which 59% would have been good. I 19... <laughs> 93? I saw a video last week that was, I follow this great account called Bills VHS, and they just post old grainy footage things of the Buffalo Bills. And they had one of, uh, of Joe Ferguson. And it said, Ferguson led the National Football League in passing last season, completing 61% of his passes. And I was like, oh my yeah. God. It's just a totally different time, right? Yeah, it, it, it absolutely is. And I don't think their depth of target would something that would indicate. Oh, by the way, uh, their quarterbacks got sacked on 10% of dropbacks. So uh, it was it was real rough for Ottawa. Masoli fixes a lot of that. Masoli, we'll talk about it one of my points. I, I really, I don't know if he's the one I would have let go if I was Hamilton, if I could, if I could prevent that. The, the, they improved their defense. You mentioned the Money Hunter and Patrick Levels acquisitions. That is terrific. Tremaine Washington was so nice on that uh, boundary halfback spot for Edmonton this past season. They improve on the defensive line, the offensive line. William Powell at least gives you a back that you know, hey, we don't have to start throwing in number 49 and number like random folks in there in, in hopes of finding something. If you can block for them, Powell to me could still get yards. The, the question I'm going to have for them is uh, they went and got receivers but Darvin Adams and BJ Cunningham, two guys that I, I, I want to love, have been ha- had some banged up problems yeah. in the last couple of years. Yeah. So if they if they're both good to go, Darvin, BJ, RJ, Jalen Acklin, plus a Canadian, that'll do. Yeah. That, that will do. Uh that'll be very nice. But uh, I've 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 always I've always been left, I don't want to say I've always been left wanting with Darvin Adams, but I just want him to be healthy because I know he can wreck people from that exposition when he is healthy. And I just, I need more Darvin in my life. I need more BJ Cunningham in my life. Uh, and I very intentionally use his last name there. Cause if I say, I need more BJ in my life, we're all <laughs> in trouble here. Uh, but uh, no, Ottawa, Ottawa to me at, for, for Toronto is going to regress for, for reasons that we can talk about Montreal. I don't know, but Ottawa and if Hamilton falters under Dane, uh, with Dane Evans, a quarterback, Ottawa could end up first in the East Marsh. Yeah. And this is, um, I'll just, I'll throw in my second one here of the off season before we get to your second, which is uh, mm-hmm. Mont- Montreal regression is something that I, I have a feeling about because when I'm looking around, I, I still think Toronto has more than enough to be able to challenge week in, week out, steal a couple of games from the West and all the rest. But it's Montreal that when I was looking in free agency, I kept hearing all this stuff about best quarterback room in the entire league. And I'm like, yeah, I respect Trevor Harris a lot. And I think that Vernon Adams Jr. is a great 
quarterback down the road in development and he's got this unique playing style and I'm a huge fan of watching him do his thing. But then it's like they had Dominique Davis. I'm like an, an older Trevor Harris, Dominique Davis and Vernon Adams Jr. trying to stay healthy while running around. And he's also apparently adding 10, 15 pounds to his body, which I'm like, I don't know how that's going to affect his game better Ooh. or worse. When yeah. when I hear that stuff, I'm like, OK, I, I don't think that that should be the hallmark of your offseason is two guys who can't be on the field. And consistently for about a two week period around free agency, it was like jazz hands about quarterbacks, quarterbacks, quarterbacks. And it's like, I get it. You got Gina Lewis back. You got Jake Wynicke back. The reality is if Ackland doesn't go to Ottawa, I think Wynicke ends up in, in Ottawa. So like they got him because that's sl- that slot, that position was essentially filled by Jalen Ackland. And then you, like you lose BJ Cunningham. They're probably okay with that because of the injuries, as you said, the rest, uh, the wrist, otherwise um, the offensive line, they ended up losing uh, who is it? David Foucault and Tony Washington, I believe went out to Edmonton. Uh, then yep. you lose Money Hunter, Patrick Levels, uh, Tyquan Glass. Uh, did he end up going to Winnipeg? Tyquan oh. Glass, I believe. Uh, give me a, top, give me a yeah, second, I, yeah. I just, sorry, that's an unfair one to throw at you randomly, but I... Um, Winnipeg, I, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so I was just, I was looking at the things that they were losing and then the things that they were adding. And the things that they were adding did not feel equal to the things that they were losing. And it's not that I think, you know, Tony Washington's the best offensive lineman in the CFL. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is when I go down through the list, like just pulling it up here, that they were there were some pieces there that went to other places that I respect a lot. And the things they got back, Avery Ellis, uh, we'll see. Tyrese Beverett has been a deep rotation guy for them at, at, in Hamilton for a couple of years at this point. Uh, Mike Jones at a Winnipeg, good DB, not, I would think, highly, highly sought after. Herjie Mayala really struggled, I thought, in his second year in Calgary in 2021. And then Frederick Chagnon at Ottawa is, is a University of Montreal Carabin alumni when Machocho was there, who is a special mm-hmm. teamer. And it's like that that list of guys that came in from other places compared to the names that we mentioned. I even missed some, like DJ Lalama, special teamer, he left. Ty Cranston, free safety, he's gone. Uh, Woody Barron, I didn't even get to him. David Menard, like they probably just didn't want to pay him yep. the amount he was asking for. So I just, I feel like there's there's more that went out the door than came in in Montreal. And that's intriguing to me because it felt like they were getting ready and and not that they aren't, they still are. They're trying to push through and find a way to get over the hump and be a legitimate threat in the East. And I don't think this off season confirmed for me that they should definitely be in that conversation. I think they might slide backwards. I, I, I kind of don't see how they don't slide backwards because to me, uh, you mentioned having three quarterbacks, I, I feel when you put it together game day roster, you're only carrying two quarterbacks. And if you if you carry Vernon Adams, Trevor Harris, and say w- say Vernon starts that, and you have Trevor Harris as your backup, you're hoping Trevor Harris never sees the field, right? So you're by by your own hope getting zero value from that backup quarterback spot. Are you going to put Trevor Harris as the third quarterback and uh, and make him the game day scratch because Dominic Davis can do some extra stuff in the run game and the sneak game? I that would be bold. That would be bold to game day scratch Trevor Harris if he yeah. doesn't win the job. Uh, or, I mean, just straight out release him, but you gave him, you gave him bucks up front. And I think, uh, was it Dunk who, who said, hey, it's, it's worth Trevor, it's worth the Trevor Harris, but a hundred grand to go win the quarterback job. Yeah. Which, okay. I, but well, I want to, I want to say on that for a second, that, sure. and, I, and I understand what Dunk's doing there, but like, every quarterback has playtime incentives in their contract. Like if you're going in as a backup quarterback, everybody has things where, yeah, you're going to make more money if you are a starter. So the VA I saw was not happy about that on social media where he said yep. like, he's, he's trying to turn teammates against each other. And that's what he doesn't, you can have whatever opinion you have on the style of reporting and trying to get the clicks and all that stuff. But for me, I was like, yeah, that's a, that's a fact. Like if you were to look in any player's contract, it might not be a hundred thousand, but well, every, yeah. every quarterback, like right now, I would say, there's a lot riding for Nick Arbuckle to be able to be the starting quarterback of the Edmonton Elks because there's no way that there was not. And I mean, unless he has a a poor agent who didn't negotiate things properly, but for him to sign that deal, a little signing bonus money when they renegotiated things up front and then saying, there's no way he gets named the starter week one or percentage of snaps played throughout the year or percentage of snaps per game, or there's going to be this stuff built in. So yeah, it's worth it to Trevor, but it's worth it to everybody. Yeah, just is it worth it just to a six figure degree? Right. Right. Like uh he he they had a, a list. I forget it was on three now, forgive me if it was 
dunk or not, but it was the nine quarterbacks and what they'll what they'll get paid. Yep. Nathan Burke, if he plays fifty one percent of snaps, gets an extra five hundred bucks. That a boy. Okay, well, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not a hundred grand. Like yeah, you, we all know hearing this and talking about this, hundred grand is a hundred grand. Um, Montreal, they they have the best player at the least important position on offense. They have William Stanback. That guy, I that guy, I would kill to have on my team. Yep. But this is not a run, it's not a running back league anymore. As much as he is unbelievable, it can go for two fifty. You you have to throw the ball, uh, and I I haven't seen in Vernon Adams a guy who's going to to lift everything up if if there aren't problems. The the offensive line you ran through some of the changes. I don't know what's happening there. The I have all nine depth charts on on, on a file. And theirs has the most holes because I literally don't know what they're doing with that, what they're doing in spots. Like, okay, Mike Jones goes over to the field side. Uh, Greg Reed and Ty Cranston, they're moving on. Chris Aki, I assume, is back. Usher and Ellis off the ends, good. Mike Moore, Armando Sewell. Okay, you're set as as, as starters if you're going to go, if you're somehow going to go four Americans on your front four. Uh, Gino Lewis, love, love, love. There are... It's not an Ottawa Red Blacks 20, no. 21 level of, of holes and concern because they at least have a quarterback who is on my list to discuss. Um, but Montreal, yeah, Montreal's a candidate for fourth in the East right now. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't know if you say if you went that far, but I'm with the thought that Montreal's a candidate for fourth in the East right now. Yeah, that's, that's my thought is that I, I yeah. believe uh and again it's to me it's kind of a crapshoot because it's like how good can Masoli make Ottawa how much will Dane Evans having an offense built around him with the comfort of knowing he's the starter full-time uh you know if he doesn't stay healthy is Matthew Shields good enough to be able to step in for Dane and win a couple of games when you need him in the middle of the season because hey fingers crossed we're going full length season here so there's going to be those stretches where guys are going to have to jump in and your backup matters like that's a real thing so maybe in that sense Montreal is much better off than we realize at this point, but my initial thought on projecting them is, is somewhere in that three, four slot as it stands. But what's your, uh, your next one here for the off season. So Ottawa was on my list. So uh, number three, I, I just wrote Dane Evans. Mm. And yesterday, yesterday I was going to look at a stat because I had talked about, you know, in a few interviews for this job, Hey, well, give me, give me some numbers that, uh, that have been revealed to you as you approach this bomber job. I went, Zach Caleros is unbelievable at keeping pressure from turning into sex yep. and watching the great cup game. He just kind of, uh, Deja lays getting pushed by Dylan Wynn, and, and he just kind of pushes back up a little bit and then throws it over the top. And you go, God, you just, the, the number of ways that this guy who you don't think is an, is an incredible athlete. I, you just don't look at him and go, Oh, he's a, a Rakeem Cato athlete or a Vernon Adams type athlete. He just avoids getting, getting sacked for his career. Uh, when he is pressured, he's sacked 16% of the time. Uh, if you can name the court, this is a test for Marshall Ferguson, <laughs> 2015 to 21. There is one quarterback who, when pressured, is sacked less often than Zach Caleros. Minimum 700 attempts. Name oh, that quarterback. That's he's a... currently, he's retired right now. Okay. Uh, I mean, my gut says Mike O'Reilly. No. Okay. Travis Lule. Oh, okay. Yeah. So my thinking on that, the answer would be either somebody who is really elusive in terms of scrambling mm -hmm. or somebody who is really smart at getting rid of the ball. And Lule would fall under really smart at knowing how and when to get away just enough to throw, throw the ball. Yeah. So I've, I've made this a very long way. Uh, I was looking at that Zach Calero stat and I was going down the rest of the list and it's guys with a minimum of 500 attempts. Dane Evans, when pressured, sacked on 31% of his attempts. The only quarterback who sacked more often is Drew Willie. Mm -hmm. And by the, by the end of his time, Drew Willie appeared to be broken in the Canadian Football League. Hamilton has gone all in with Dane Evans. And you, you probably had to because it wouldn't have made sense to bring those two guys back. Um, they, I, I have, I am nowhere, I'm not anywhere near other people in my confidence in Dane Evans because the interceptions. The propensity to get sacked, uh, it, it's, there are so many things that I look at and go, okay, I, I like the thought of this if it works, but watching the Grey Cup, the second straight Grey Cup, when will he throw his first pick? Oh, yeah, it's super early, and now Hamilton's in a hole. It's, I just don't see it yet. 
I don't see it with Dane Evans. And now that they, they don't have a real option at number two uh, that I can think of to, yeah. to go, okay, well, we're in trouble. So now it's Jeremiah Masoli time. Okay, Matt Schilt, I, I think, can do some stuff as their number two. But I am very concerned, and you, you can expand on this a little more. We're on the kind of opposite sides that Dane Evans, but the interceptions and the negative plays, they haven't gone away, and he's not a rookie. So Hamilton pushing all in on Dane Evans is something I want to see in the first six weeks of the season. Yes, and I, I, when I was getting ready for the Grey Cup this year, I went back and watched some of those poor decisions, those interceptions, uh, whether it be against Winnipeg or otherwise, from 2019, because obviously he had a heck of a lot more attempts in 2019 than he did in 21. So mm-hmm. I went back and looked at that, and so many of the throws early in his career are just forces. Like there's, there's a throw against Calgary where Brandon Banks is running a go route and he throws it up against Trey Roberson and the throw is in a bad location, but also the free safety is just there to catch it like a punt. And it's like basic quarterback stuff. Dane knows that like he was making, he was making decisions to me that were outside of himself. There's another one into the boundary against BC where same idea that I think the half roll, I think they were playing, you know, cut coverage, jam the receiver the wide out at the line and he's trying to basically throw it into the turkey hole just to the outside of the the corner and the half and the half rolls down from on high and just jumps it and it's like he was just trying to rip it into a hole that didn't exist and so that's why I feel like the more that I've watched him in 2021 he's felt like he's a little bit more confident on his feet and his decision making is improving and this is the other thing that kills me is like I agree with you the, the numbers and the metrics and stuff I believe in that but then mm-hmm. when I, I see young quarterbacks doing that, I think our job is also to project, is this going to improve? Is the process there? Do I see these little bits of difference that he's making in his game? For me, I do see that in Dane. And that's why when I see Hamilton investing, I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, I think that this is, they see the way that he is trending or direct um, heading towards. And the other thing that I would say on the the pressures number, which that's a scary one, anytime you mentioned Drew Willie, but uh I feel like from watching, again, I'm not going to say, hey, I watched the game, and you didn't because you did. But, man, Hamilton, a lot of those pressures felt unavoidable. Like, they, the pressure quality that teams were getting was take the snap, KO Gafor gets danced, there's an inside you know, rush from his left side, and he's looking here, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, God, and he just folds up. <laughs> so there was yeah. a, a lot of that, unfortunately, for Dane. But, yeah, I mean, that's going to be a great one to look at throughout this year is does he take the next step? does he find progress that convinces you that, okay, he's avoiding more pressures. He's making better decisions. He's not being reckless with the football. The, um, I can't think of the term that you use, but the kind of theoretical interceptions, like ones that should have been picked off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, Adjust interceptions. Adjust interceptions. Yeah. Can that number drop? Like, can he find the right people at the right time um, and still be daring and still throw it down the field and not be scared? Because that's always the push pull is guys that are trying to, reel their game in hello Vernon Adams Jr if you reel the game in too much they're not themselves anymore if you don't reel them in at all how many mistakes do you allow until there's a cost benefit analysis here that's not really worth having them on the field because you're having more mistakes than not so yeah I believe in Dane I think that Dane's got great potential but uh yeah there's certainly things that need to be cleaned up going forward here I just for me part of the reason that I love Masoli going to Ottawa is yeah I can't wait to see Masoli with Lapo but I also just can't wait to see Dane with a full season to himself because yeah. I just want to see what that looks like. Cause we really haven't yet. Cause 19, he comes in in week six and takes him to the great cup. 20 doesn't play 21 split season. Didn't get very many attempts up. Uh, just final ones for me on, on Dane Evans. Hey, uh, you mentioned adjusted interceptions. So interceptions plus dropped interceptions yeah. uh, divided by a number of attempts uh, above league average. Uh, he He's at about the league average on the number of interceptable passes that are intercepted. So he's not a victim of any bad luck. His uncatchable pass rate above league average. His his pressure his pressure rate below league average. So he's under pressure of, well, a fraction below. So let's just call it league average. But sacked on 31% of the times he's under pressure. Yeah. Um, and depth of target below league average. You go, okay, I'm, I'm going to need to see it. And Hamilton doesn't really have a, they have no cover now. They've been mm-hmm. blessed. We've talked for for two, for three three calendar years about oh they're covered best quarterback situation in the CFL. Well now it's Dane and we only I mean to be fair to him it's only seven hundred something dropbacks worth of 
worth of evidence playoff included. So, but that team is going to go as Dane Evans goes. And that's, that's something I'm going to want to watch. That's my number three. And that's why like he's got 700 for his career. He'll get 300 plus this year. And like all things considered, if he stays healthy, right, he'll get up in that, that 200, 300 area, at least where we can get a real good sense for what he's about. Well, when you say 300, like he's going to get 800 dropbacks. What do you, right. what do you mean 300? Uh, sorry, I mean like completions where we can actually see oh. him like show off his arm kind of thing, right? So once, we, we, go. Get, yeah, once yeah. we get to that point, we'll be able to understand his game. And, and again, like you say, that is a bit of a, probably a low number. Getting my uh, my my numbers reacquainted here as we roll through the pod. But um, <laughs> my next one is you, just, uh, go ahead. I was going to say, what do you got at number three? I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. so I'm going to go uh, into your neck of the woods now. Ellingston, uh, this is going to be a really interesting study for both of us. I know that you'll be killing this all year long, but the reason I'm intrigued by this is that when you see Brian Burnham sign in free agency for what he did, and I'm like, oh man, I mean, he could have really shook up free agency if he left BC. He goes back because it's clear that he has belief in Nathan Rourke. Otherwise, he probably would not have gone back in that spot. Then you see the money that Duke Williams and Kenny Lawler get, and it's like, is Kenny Lawler worth that if he doesn't have a great quarterbacking situation that's solid like Zach Kalaros? I'm like, man, if I was Lawler, like, full honesty, I probably would have just taken a little bit less money and stayed with Zach. And then, of course, Ellingson is like, hello, that looks like a nice opportunity, jumps into Winnipeg. And for me, I, I will be enamored all year with the, the idea of Lawler versus Ellingson. And what is the actual value of a receiver? And what is, how much does fit matter in a quarterback receiver offensive system relationship? So for me, it's a simple one. It's just Ellingson, but it's also a little bit of like Ellingson versus Lawler. Oh yeah, no. And Ellingson at, I, I don't know what, what Ellingson makes, but at 60% of his salary, to, to me, there was no question that Winnipeg, Winnipeg wins that. It's essentially a trade, right? Yeah. It's essentially a trade one guy leaves one team to go to team B, team B to team A. Uh, 300 grand versus, I don't know, 180 for Ellingson. We haven't heard of the number. That's an easy win for, for Winnipeg in that case. Kenny Lawler, unbelievable last season. Fantastic season. Ellingson, 5,000-yard seasons. Just as reliable as can be. Terrifies defenses by he leads the league in pass interference calls drawn every, every single season. And just just plops right in at that wide receiver spot. Like this is this is a made in heaven yeah. for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I I I am yeah, I I I, I like Greg a, a lot as a dude. It this is such a good move for for him. And I, I think your your point about we talked about it leading up to free agency. Lawler leaves for a very uncertain quarterback situation. Is it Nick Arbuckle? Is it Khalil Tate or JT Barrett or Kai Loxley or uh, heaven forbid it's Taylor Cornelius again? Lawler is going to have. Remember, remember how people treated uh, how people treated Darrell Walker after that first year in Toronto. Yeah. Oh, he's done. He's lost it. He had sixty catches on one hundred and twenty targets. It's awful. Yeah, yeah. He when the ball's at your shin, at best, you're not going to look your best. So. If Lawler is out there running routes with with a rookie quarterback who struggles, what are, what's he going to get in free agency twenty twenty two? So I I might have if if the option was available to him to stay in Winnipeg and three hundred and one eighty whatever the numbers are are yeah. substantial and get secure the bag. Yeah, uh, Greg Ellingson was it was a master pickup for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers because instead of okay, well Darvin's gone and Kenny Lawler's gone. Yeah, okay, that's that's true. But uh, oh, by the way, remember Greg Ellingson? You may have forgot because he was getting the old shin balls uh, in 2021. But no, those balls are going to be on target now with with uh, the best quarterback in the CFL. So uh, I love that. I love that pickup, and I uh, I love the thought of getting to watch Greg Ellingson for 18 games plus plus one preseason and the playoff run. There's, uh, there's just certain words that come up when you're in conversation on sports that are comedically funny. And I feel like I have to do my very limited Jay on right impersonation right now from his uh, podcast, Shin Balls, the Edmonton Elk story, <laughs> right? It's like that was the 2021 season, Shin Balls. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it'll be fun to see what they, what they end up creating. And I know, like you say, sometimes there's just these relationships that are 
spoken into existence and Ellingson, Kalara was Winnipeg, two-time Grey Cup champions. Like when that happened on the first day of free agency, my gut reaction was, come on, really? And it's not even because I'm angry at it. I was just like, it makes too much sense to not happen. And that's such a Kyle Walters move to just patiently sit back, wait for the market to shake out. Kenny wants what? Nah, I'm I'm good, man. That seems crazy. I'm going to let BC and Edmonton fight over that one. Give Greg a call. See what he thinks. I'm sure I'm sure it was a five second conversation. Yeah, we'll give you this. Uh, yeah, okay. I, that sounds amazing to me. Thank you so much. So now we get to see it on the field, which I'm pumped for. Uh, what do you got on your next one? Yeah, just final thought on Winnipeg, what mm. they do at the X. Well, I'll, I'll need to see what they do at the X position. Rasheed Bailey, I assume, comes in at that boundary slot back, but who takes over at Darvin Adams spot? I, I just look at this, I assume it's someone we haven't really seen much before, but uh, that. Kolaris is going to get the ball out. He's not afraid to give you opportunities. So little, little, little post corner and Greg Ellison's <laughs> going for, for double digit touchdowns this season. Uh, God, that's man. Uh, that's the number. Is that the number two receiver value in the Canadian football league right now behind Reggie Bagleton? Well, I, I, assuming we know what, what Ellingson made, but Bagleton for 165 back to Calgary, Amazing. man, that's some value pickups right there by, by those two teams. Uh, we might as well stay with my number four is yep. uh, does Winnipeg Winnipeg's had some losses in free agency. Uh, I, it feels like I haven't checked it, but it feels like more so uh, from 20, 21 to 22, more losses than there were from 19 to 21. It seemed like they got just about everything going back uh, this season. But uh, who, who is it? Uh, DeAndre Alford goes to the NFL. Stove gets away to to B.C., uh, they lose Drew Desjardins to the NFL. They let uh, Darvin Adams go. Andrew Harris, they let him go as well. Uh, what's What does Winnipeg look like on this road to the three-peat? Mm-hmm. It's still fairly contingent on Zach Caleros remaining healthy, as now I think every team is contingent on a starting quarterback remaining healthy. But that's that's the MLP and the highest-paid player in the league and the best quarterback, you know, and essentially two seasons – running so uh does winnipeg have enough to repeat because i had no question i honestly i didn't have any well i had one question about their roster into 21 and it was how will the boundary side defensive back duo do turns out they'll be unbelievable and one of them will go to the falcons uh i have there are more questions now this season and in a west that what's bc look like can saskatchewan hang around man if Bo if Bo is right in calgary calgary looks like they might be really good uh winnipeg might come back to the pack do they have enough to three-peat is something i'll want to see in the first six weeks i know you're going to get a really good sense for this being around the team every day but i i feel like from the fact of of what i know about mike o'shea and zach claros and kyle walters and wade miller and like the brain trust the, the structure that's there, those questions that they have, yeah, obviously you'd like to bring back Stove. And yeah, you'd rather keep DeAndre Alford and all these little moves you're talking about. Desjardins, ah, oh, man, we drafted him. We loved him. Like, we want to, you know, keep him in house. But I almost feel like after two championships, O'Shea is going to revel in the idea of, hey, look, adversity. Like, there's, <laughs> there's something about yeah. him that seems to like the idea of, and the challenge, and it's not as though it's like, oh, this game has become too easy. We take it for granted. We've won back-to-back championships. It it just feels, though, like those guys enjoy the grind. And I think it's what makes them great. And I think it's why they've won back-to-back great cups is that they do enjoy the grind of working their way through these things. And uh, they're going to think it through, and they're going to give it the best answer they possibly can. And then we get to judge the moves they made and see whether or not those holes are filled in the right way. But there's, there's something in the, in the human aspect of that, that I think Winnipeg will enjoy trying to figure this out for the first time in a couple of years. Yeah. They, they did the important part, right? They got all their stars. They got most of their stars back. Uh, Big Hill defensive player of the year. Jefferson, Jeff Coat were defensive player of the year worthy seasons last year. Bryant and Hardrick on the edges, their offensive line is, is four fifths intact, but uh, if Jeff Gray slides into that left guard spot, Gray's got starting experience in the Canadian Football League. Uh, Brandon Alexander will return from injury. The boundary side of Winston Rose and Deadrick Nichols, yes, please. Kyrie Wilson making plays in the Grey Cup too. You're like, oh, okay, they they got the big dogs back, and then how how, how did they fill in with the rest? Well, they may have gotten. 
honestly, when you find Nichols and Alford and you plug them in and they're unbelievable, you probably, honestly, you probably got lucky because how, how, when have we ever seen that before? <laughs> that rookies came in and just were fantastic. Uh, again, back to the Grey Cup game. Uh, Alford had gone over. Uh, Alford had gone over to the uh, field half spot, field field corner spot, and Hamilton in, in the early stages, like we're going after this guy. And he's like, cool. It, it ain't gonna work real well. Yes. And he, oh, God, and that guy was a rookie in the Canadian Football League. And I'm so. I just, it's, it's, it was a fantastic find. There's probably a little luck involved in it working out that well. Uh, but there's, yeah, they, they got to fill some holes. Winnipeg does, but getting the big dogs back, they've got to be the great cup favorite, but it's not, they're not as much the favorite as to me as they were in 2021. Yep. Yeah. I think that that's fair to say. Uh, my next one for you here is going, you mentioned it kind of briefly, like is Bo back to being what he was? I saw, a quote recently from him that said uh, that he was getting the ball out quicker last year because he was obviously dealing with injuries. And I think the number DT that jumped out to me this off season studying Bo, because it was so unlike him in years gone by was his attempt percentage. And the reason I bring this up is that uh, Bo attempted 18.8% of his passes in what I refer to as the check down zone, which is from zero to 10 yards in between the hashes, like right in the middle of the field, zero to 10. That's, and it's not that quarterbacks are lazy. It's that that's where their read takes them or they're being more cautious with the football or in Bo's case, he just admitted I had to get the ball out faster because I did not feel secure with my health. 18.8% is 6% above the league average in throwing to that spot on the field. And for those of you that don't know, usually those numbers vary maximum one maybe two percent so for him to be six percent above in that check down zone throwing it over the middle short underneath to me that just screamed and i knew it from watching him because god anti milinovic leader does not deserve that many targets on little dump offs so <laughs> watching him get the ball out that way even when he was back and the leg was healthier uh that was confusing to me and that's not who he is if you've studied Bo Levi in the past, what I love about him is that his target charts and his heat charts, they don't look like many other quarterbacks, which is to say field side, boundary side, zero to 10, 30 to 40, outside the numbers, in between the hash. Who cares? The mm-hmm. dude the dude does not care where the ball is supposed to go. I've heard there's this great John Huffnagel quote that I think came out after, uh, I believe, 2018 when they won the Grey Cup, where he said, you know, Bo when I'm up in the booth, I love that he's daring, but sometimes it's a little too daring even for my blood. And I always think about that with him because when I studied the way that he attacks the field, it's just like he will put the ball anywhere at any time. And in 2021, he was putting it in the most conservative place in the entire field, 6% more than the league average. So yes, health is the thing. Yes, Bagleton coming in, getting Kamar Jordan back in the fold, Kadeem Carey under contract, offensive line trying to find some pieces that fit. That's all great stuff, but it was really for me about that's not who he is. Like his chart should not look like that. Now let's see how much he gets back to what we've seen in the past versus what this thing was in 2021. That's a complete anomaly for his career. Yeah, the, the last two seasons, uh, for the reasons that, that you mentioned, uh, I've wondered if, okay, his body is just isn't there. Like he still thinks he can do this stuff, but his body is not able to do the stuff that he had no problem with. The shoulder in, too, right? So, like, it, like it was well, obviously exactly. the, the leg, but the shoulder might be the bigger concern. Yeah, I yeah, and I just wanted to cast a broad net with, with both uh, inside both those. 2018, 40 touchdowns and 15 interceptions. <laughs> and I remember, I remember uh, the Grey Cup uh, ahead of the Grey Cup game 17 against uh, Toronto. I printed up my own little charts, uh, plotted all their passes, and it was Ricky Ray and Boldy by Mitchell. And Ricky was Ricky was the conventional. It's to the outsides. There's a void in the middle, and it was it was shorter because it was Ricky Ray. Bo not afraid to attack the deep middle, and you go, that's a guy who believes in his arm. Yep. And I feel like he still believed in it in 19 and 21, and it was just to me not the same. Uh, what was the number I wanted to pull about uh, Mitchell? Oh, uh, Bo, he's he he is the gunslinger, right? That's why that's why he. He's gotten his uh, his reputation. He plays the game just—it's so much fun to watch. 
Uh, 2018, almost 12 yards per attempt, uh, 12 air yards per attempt. Depth of target, 12 yards downfield. That's a monstrous number. Absolutely. The league average is about 9.4. That's a monstrous number. Uh, 2019, 10.8 yards downfield per attempt. 2021, 9.2. So there's there's the checkdowns that you that you talk about, the Milanovic leaders and stuff. And that is a dramatic change. So what will that if that's if Bo's got more in the tank and it's back in 22, awesome. It's yeah. so much fun to watch, and Calgary's gonna be a, a real troublemaker. If not, um 2023, Bo Levy Mitchell's in the TSN panel. I like it's, it's, it's just, it's been hard to watch the last couple of years for a guy we know can be just so much fun and so incredible at our game. Yeah, I agree with you. I'll just uh, throw this out there as well as we move on to your fourth uh, headline of the off season here, moving into 2022, when you said the 40 and 15 uh, mm. mar- mark for him in 2018, I was digging into Trey Ford, the quarterback that's coming out of Waterloo's numbers uh, yesterday. And I did not realize this until I really started to dive in on stuff. 2018, and I guess here's a question for you. What's more impressive? 2018, Bo Levi Mitchell, 40 touchdowns, 15 interceptions, or Trey Ford, 2018, 27 touchdowns, two interceptions. Is that, okay, that's, is that exactly the Nick Foles line from that one year? (laughs) 27 and two? I, like, I'm, go ahead. His ratio changed as he went deeper into his career, 2019 and 21 and all the rest. But I look back at that 18, which was his first full year starting at Waterloo. And I'm like, I get it. It's OUA. It's not as difficult as the CFL for quarterback play. And so you can't compare those numbers directly. But I'm like, God, man, you know what I would have done go in the OUA that goes 27 and two? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Nick Foles, 2013, 27 touchdowns, <laughs> two interceptions. Hopefully Trey's career progresses yeah. much better than, than Nick, well, Nick Foles. I, I mean, if, if uh, Trey Ford ends up winning a, a Grey Cup MOP and then disappears forever, I think we'll remember the Grey Cup MOP, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right, so we, we've got four of mine down. Are, are we on three or four? Uh, uh, Rourke, Ottawa, Dane Evans, and Winnipeg three-peat for me so far. Have you put uh, out yes. three? or? I've, I've got my four. I've got Red Blacks Rebuild, Montreal Regression, Ellingson versus Lawler, and Bo Levi. So this is a, your Perfect. fifth year. All right, number number five and the final one for me is as we approach the season of 2021, uh, both the East and the West were set up with this young, exciting running quarterback who might be poised to take over the league. Cody Fajardo in Saskatchewan, Vernon Adams in Montreal. As we approach 2022, we have these two quarterbacks, still captains of their team, still leading the charge. But we've got a lot more questions about both of them, I think, than we had going into 2021. So where do they go? Uh, so many times I, I was seeing some Jonathan Jennings numbers last night. Remember how exciting he was and how people who have their hands in the air currently like me thought, oh, this guy's going to be MOP level after what we saw last year. And it never materialized for Jennings, right? So what direction do Fajardo and Vernon Adams both go? Again, to me, guys with high floors because they add elements in the run game. Uh, in Saskatchewan, they'll use Pajardo in, in the design run game even more because he's so good at that, and he's so good at protecting himself in those situations. His deep ball, we talked about it endlessly. His deep ball, it was, it was not there in 2021. So uh, does Duke Williams, Shaq Evans, is that, is that enough to revive that? Is that just the worst luck that the quarterback has had in a long time? And it even bounces back to even average, hey, the Saskatchewan offense is going to fly. Uh, Vern Adams, you, you and I have talked about Ad- Adams. He pulls Geno Lewis out of the end zone with an errant pass that would have won the game against, I think it was Calgary. Yeah. Is that the, yeah. And you go, ah, that's, he, he one hopped one, maybe in that same drive, but certainly one that, I could have won in the game and you go, there's so much to love, but there's so much I still want to see. So what direction do these two super exciting quarterbacks that if they were the top two quarterbacks in the CFL, can you imagine the position we'd be in if those guys were the top two quarterbacks in the Canadian football league, because all the questions about them had been answered this, it would be, it would be phenomenal. It, uh, I don't know if it's like uh, when Bo and Mike Riley were at the, the height of their powers, but 
having one in the East and one in the West and go, oh, what if we get them in a Grey Cup? Oh, oh boy, uh, here's Marsh calling a game in Montreal. And it's, <laughs> it's Saskatchewan visiting and, and you're just creaming your jeans because you watch these two guys go. Um, there's, there's just, they, they both have still, to me, all the potential in the world. Where does it go in 2022? Uh, I just, aside from the creaming your jeans comment, the thing that comes into my mind, uh, phrasing, is that uh, I I just think of the Bill Hader meme or gif or whatever when he's the game show host on Saturday Night Live and he just looks into the camera side eye and goes, chaos, right? <laughs> like that, if they were just running around the entire game and they were at the height of their powers, it, it would be chaos. But it would also, it, you yeah. know what I think it would feel a little bit more like is 90s CFL. Like if those guys were mm. called running game and a lot of the quarterback being used uh, on the ground and, but the thing is in Montreal, it's like VA creates for himself, but you want to give the carries to stand back because you want to keep VA healthy because you want to take the downfield shots because you want Wineke and uh, Wineke and, uh, and Lewis to be what they are. And it's so, yeah, the, the equation of finding success for those two teams with those two quarterbacks, uh, we will be keeping a very close eye on that for you throughout this year. Just on the outside looking in of my fifth and final was Derek Taylor getting added to the booth and CJOB. I thought that was, that was one of the more, <laughs> and the, the great quote that I loved was uh, when you did the interview with Rob Vanstone and he said, what about the, uh, cause you, you said you're not going to back to writers radio. And uh, you said, I've talked to a couple of people. There's some interest there. And then he asked you the question, what about uh, that bombers radio play by play job? And the direct quote in the paper was, you know, I should probably look into that at some point. And I laugh. Like, I just, when I saw that quote, I'm like, he either knows or he's just trying to drive people crazy. And either way, I'm a fan of that quote. And I just thought it was so fantastic. So did you know at that point? Uh, I didn't know. Okay. No, by the, t- by the time I left my job, I, di- I didn't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just, I felt there, there were, actually the day the news broke, uh, I had three other kind of offers of, hey, you, you can come Man, do some stuff with us. Must hey, be how's nice. some- well, it, it's one of those things, right? I, and honestly, I assume the same thing, uh, something happened to you when, when TSN shut her down. You're like, oh, I didn't know all these people thought I was good. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. This, is, this is really quite flattering. You have to go through something awful to, to have this good thing reveal itself. You go, oh, that's super, that's super sweet. I'm glad you, you think of, of me in, in that way. So, uh, yeah, no, it, it hadn't been I, – I thought there was a really good chance, yeah. right, because connections to the city of Winnipeg, nine years calling – Nine seasons calling Manitoba Bison's games. Uh, I can recount uh, the days where I saw the the Bison's backfield of Anthony Coombs, Nick Dembski, and Keenan LaFrance. And go, wow. I remember when Nick Dembski transitioned to receiver at the Bison's because they went, oh, uh, we need to get this kid on the field. Yeah. And Coombs is killing it at running back. So let's let's make this change. And now Nick Dembski is the, I don't know, if he's the most or second most multiple weapon in the Canadian Football League, which is with Braylon Addison. I would certainly count in that in that uh, as well. And honestly, it, it, all the guys Hamilton has, my goodness, Tim White doing in the Grey Cup. Oh, man. Yeah. Anyway, wasn't, wasn't, that, wasn't that great when Tim White was just like, yeah, I'll play the Brown Addison role. And we were like, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's, man, Hamilton was a lot of, that's some real cool misdirection stuff going in there. No, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy. It's, I'm so happy it worked out. And uh, it's, it's a city I know. It's a company I've worked for before. Uh, I, I don't have a ton of history with, with Doug Brown, but I've had him on the show a couple of times and, and just to hear people talk about Doug Brown, like he is, he's as good as a dude as it gets. Seems I'm really re- difficult to work with. Doug seems like a terrible person to hang out in the booth with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, he's got that, he, he's got a different energy level than I do, but he seems to have the, the proper level of sarcasm. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. But uh, I leave a great partner in Luke Mullinder, and I pick up a great partner in, in Doug Brown. Uh, it's, I'm all Canadian at defensive tackle. Jake Thomas would probably be my favorite <laughs> interview. I'm all Canadian at defensive tackle, but it's a, it's it's an opportunity, and I'm I'm super excited to take it. Uh, I just hope, as I say, I don't call a third straight loss in the West Final because then I'm going to think it's about me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, my last one for real here that I'll just chuck in, and uh, and we'll just talk about for a second because. A uh, little Easter egg for everybody that's listening here to the breakdown, because I know you guys don't listen to all of the podcasts. I don't expect that of you, but you have certain shows that you like coming up this week on the daily show, which we put out weekly on Saturdays now on CFP. Uh, it is going to be Brandon Banks joining Mike Daly and myself 
to discuss contract negotiations in the Canadian Football League and how that what? all how that all shakes out. And so, uh, Brandon Banks and Andrew Harris going to Toronto. It's either a beautiful vision that's going to be productive and fun, or it's going to be two guys that have gone past their prime and Toronto is going to sink. And I I genuinely don't know. And I I know those guys are not going to be dependent on to be their entire offense. The only thing that they do all year, they got lots of other pieces that are in the fold, but I mean, you don't bring those players in. I don't think to just cut them. You don't bring Andrew Harris in to give him 50% of the carries. You bring him in because you want to design your offense as you are our running back speedy. You are going to be one of our more explosive players. We're tired of you burning us and having 175 yard missed field goal returns for touchdowns against us at BMO and it's like you bring them in because you want to use them. Now my question is in Dinwiddie's system with McLeod Bethel Thompson, how do they use them? How much do they use them? And how much productivity mm. do they get out of them? Because their, their offense is really, I think, going to key through McLeod and Andrew and then the receivers we get to find out moving because Tavares is back, Eric Rogers is back, uh, and yeah, it's speedy into the fold and a couple of young, exciting players there as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll be curious to see how that goes. Uh, Toronto is my choice to regress this season for reasons we'll discuss later as my headphones are, are telling me they're about to drop dead. Uh, Toronto is, is a choice for me to regress this coming season. Uh, banks can, a healthy banks can certainly help keep them propped up though. I'm, I, I love the thought of that one. Yeah, absolutely. All right. That's going to do it for the breakdown for us today. Uh, we went long as always. It's nice to be back chatting football with DT. I hope that you all enjoyed. Give him a follow. It's at DT on SC for now. We'll find out. We'll let you know if that ends up having to change yeah. over, but don't want to lose the check mark. I totally get it. Thanks again to our good friends over at Fox 40 for helping us out. You can check out Fox 40 gear products to make your combine run smooth shop, whistle, stopwatches, ball pumps, and more at Fox 40 shop.com. And again, use that promo code CFP 15 at checkout for 15% off of your order. DT, thank you for this. I appreciate it. It's great to be back with you. And uh, I know that we're going to have a great year again. Let's talk some ball, Marshall.